Tossing Grenades at Windmills Podcast. Welcome to the Tossing Grenades at Windmills Podcast. I am Rhombus Tix. This is a series I'm calling Swamp Castle, where I read several short stories that I wrote a long time ago, and then make comments on them. Here is The Fires of Prophecy. His legs hurt, his feet hurt, his boots hurt, his stomach was empty, his lungs were heaving from a backpack filled with things he knew he didn't need, and his, belt, his back felt like it would snap at any moment. If war was hell, then this was the lowest plane thereof. He looked over at his sergeant. Are we there yet? His sergeant smacked him across the face with a metal gauntlet. Tough love it was. In the old stories, everybody died. That was just the way thing they did things in those days, Next reasoned as he trudged towards the city that was supposedly safe but probably wasn't. People who made up stories about the old days were full of, just full of shit. Anyways, Nax really hoped those stories didn't apply to him. Everyone who had had any brains had already fled ahead of them. Fled to Glass House because somehow the, quote, prophecy, end quote, would save them. Nax tried to make his mind flow elsewhere. He'd met a man once who claimed that a Sopinson monk had taught him the true secrets of the mind. Nax had spent an evening trying to learn alien secrets across the campfire. It wasn't doing any good right now. What did what did it matter? Sopinson secrets for the Sopinson, not humans. Three willows moved back and forth in the wind. At first he didn't think there was much to it, but then he noticed that they were in perfect sync. Only there wasn't any wind. Then he noticed the other trees moving the other way. He tried not to think about it. Nax turned his head to the left and spit. He spit that way since of right, so he wouldn't spit down the ranks. Plort was in the row behind him and would kindly do horrific things to Nax's limbs if he caused problems at this point. He hadn't volunteered for this, but he hadn't exactly gone out of his way to avoid it. Anyone who was anyone knew that the Huff was an ideological nimrod who wanted to do something glorious for the nation. Nax was conveniently not left to volunteer for one of the other sites at roll call, causing him to be, quote, drafted, end quote, into, the Huff, Huff's, into Huff's crazy plan. The man at the top of the tower of the last outpost flagged the drawbridge down and the company slowly slogged inside. It was the last place they'd have to evacuate before they reached the city. The civilians they were escorting collapsed with exhaustion. No such rest for Nax. He and the other soldiers had six hours to load up whatever they could that could be recovered from the outpost before they resumed their retreat against the ever-increasing march of the Fate Binder. Remind me why we're doing this? Next, asked, next asked Plort as he handed him one of the boxes that seemed to move aimlessly from pile to pile in no particular in no particular pattern that he could discern. Plort shrugged. Fatebinder wants to keep the prophecy from happening. And what does that have to do with us? He means to smash Spielglass to do it. He grunted, and took another box from Nax. Prophecy very long and specific. It is. He grunted, nearly dropped the box and then caught it. It needs to have Spielglass City intact to do it. Fatebinder plans to burn them all. Nax didn't care. He just knew that some nonsensical moron thought if they were that if they retreated to Glass House, everything would be fine. Stupid. The city only had a five-foot wall. They'd been working to raise it, but they'd never had get it high enough in time. The box moving took most of the night, but they'd managed to get it done an hour before dawn. A few of the men had made a makeshift cantina where they could where they were helping themselves to some beer that couldn't be moved. Nax wasn't one of them. He just put his head on the table and slept. He wasn't sure what time they woke him, but he knew that it hadn't been more than an hour or two. The sergeant looked at him with a nod of approval. Sleep while you can, son. Better than those drunken sods. Plort looked over and whispered when the Sarge was gone. Sarge was a smart guy, but beer wasn't to celebrate. It was too dull from pain hauling all this crap. Nax couldn't say blame them. He still felt stiff all over and didn't know how much his little nap had helped. When he woke, he saw three clouds in the distance that looked like three giants battling themselves. He rubbed his eyes again and looked. No, it wasn't the light playing tricks with his eyes. 
There was the head and the body and the clubs. They were moving awfully slowly, but they were definitely clobbering the crap out of each other, at least as much as the clouds could. He tried not to think about it. On into sunrise, the motley band of soldiers, stragglers, refugees, and thieves marched. Nax had to concentrate very hard not to cle- want to cleave something in two with his halberd. He felt cold through his entire body. It had seeped into him like some kind of demon, and he wanted to get it out as fast as he could. Unfortunately, the military discipline forced him to stay where he could, he was in the line, where he was in line. But at that moment, he hated his fellow soldiers with a passion. It didn't last, though. Despite the vicious last-minute blast of icy wind from the north, he managed to enter the gates of Glass House and get into an inn where he could warm up. The gates of the city were not as fortified as the outpost, at the outpost, but they were far more welcome. He could see the walls crowded with gaunt, frightened faces, looking at the final column, hoping that they'd brought some kind of hope with them. Right. The inn was called the Gurgling Goblin, and according to Plort, it was some kind of historical big deal. An emperor had been crowned here or something. It looked pretty small to Nax. Just before he went inside, he saw three black cats staring at him, lined up one after the other. He knew that the Spatians thought that black cats were bad luck, but then again, the Nwerns thought they were good luck. Technically, he shouldn't care what countries trying to destroy his homeland thought anyway, but Nax didn't care one way or the other. He opened the door and walked inside. He didn't want to think about it. He just sat as near as he could to the fire and watched as the comely but well-worn barmaid asked him for his pleasure. He told her his pleasure. She smiled, slapped him, but only a little, and got him a beer. He nursed his drink like his life depended on it. The sergeant and Plort sat down by his side. Plort said, I reckon it is only a matter of time until Fatebinder gets here now. The sergeant said, matter of time, no. But two way, no two is a ways about it. Sunset. He'll be here at sunset. I heard one of the spies talking earlier. Naf sniffed and sipped another swig of warm beer. Not much of a spy. I have good ears. Still, not much of a spy. Nax wiped his sleeve and put the drink down. So far, if he's so, if he's so far behind, why are we running all the way here? Plort rolled his eyes. Because he can move a lot faster, see? The Fate Binder is taking it nice and slow, making sure that his supply train can catch up to him. He is in no hurry. But we can count, can't count on that. Plus, the other people are here. More preparations they can make. Basic military strategy and all that. Strategy, the sergeant corrected. But otherwise, more or less correct. The Fate Binder has proven unpredictable in the past, which meant that we had to assume he'd move fast as he could, as long as... It, as long as we ling- it, it, as it was, we lingered way too long. Nax shrugged and shut up. He couldn't help but feeling this whole thing had been pointless somehow. How could it, they fight a wizard as powerful as that? Even Some even said that he'd studied with the Tsar. Others thought, said that he had all kinds of husher lore. With all that behind him, what were the pathetic fools in Glasshouse supposed to do to stop him? Trust in the prophecy, the skulls said. Fat lot they knew. Prophecy had a way of doing what it wanted. Nax was so, no skull, but he'd listened to enough tales and bars to know that people who got mixed up in prophecy usually had no idea what they were actually messing around with. And if this fate binder meant to destroy them, then the prophecy couldn't probably couldn't give two flips of a lamb's tail what happened to them. There was a low growl outside the door. Everything in the bar went quiet. There was something in that growl that wasn't natural. Everyone looked around at the kitchen and the windows. A few looked at the winding staircase that led a few fl- rooms to, on the floor. No one could bring themselves to look at the door outside, except Nax. He looked around, mildly confused. Everyone was terrified of it, afraid to move. It was probably just some kind of dog or something. The door opened of its own accord. A harsh wind filled the room, colder than... One that had greeted him upon entering the town, and ghostly jaws clamped around his throat. Nax leapt backward while the sergeant and Plort threw chairs at it. The chairs went right through it like it wasn't even there. They snarled and leapt at to Plort's throat, tearing it. Nax seared with, sneered with rage and grabbed his halberd leaning on the wall. Plort was gurgling blood by the time Nax brought his halberd down and cut the thing in two. It evaporated like smoke. The sergeant rushed to the wall and grabbed a torch. He tried to pl- apply it to Plort's throat, but couldn't because the burly man was thrashing around so wildly. 
Sit still, damn you, the sergeant cursed. Plort complied and held still. The sergeant held the torch to his neck. A thin sheen of frostbite and ice under the blood melted away. Plort looked bad, but not dead. A skull in the corner looked at Nex. How did you kill it? Nex looked back, far more concerned about his fate, the fate of his mate. I chopped it in two. What of it? You cannot kill the jaws of winter with a mortal blade, and I see nothing special about your halberd, the scout said it almost accusatory. How the hell should I know? The sergeant took the scarf and wrapped it around Plort's neck. He grunted. It'll do until we can get you to a healer. He looked at the scald. What's all this, then? That was the jaws of winter. Your soldier should not have been able to do what he did. The scald looked at Nax. He cocked his eye head a moment, that, as if trying to see something that wasn't there, and shrugged. Well, I don't know how he did it, but I can tell you for sure Nax didn't. He's got, got all the complexity of a fork. Nax had to wonder exactly what it meant. What he did know was that he didn't want to stick around the inn anymore. He picked Plort up with the sergeant's help and made his way to the large group of tents inside the city holding the soldiers. You'd think that since they'd volunteered to be last that the others would have held some rooms for them, but it didn't work out that way. Just before they went to the healer's tent, Nax looked back to see the skull outside staring at him. Nax didn't want to think about it and entered the tent. The healer was an old woman with bushy eyebrows, with busy eyebrows and shifty eyes. Her hands were amazing. She spun potion, her potions and bandages like spinning a loom, and before long, Lord's eyes were wide open and looking about. The sergeant looked at the healer. Why isn't he moving? I paralyzed him to help with the, with the healing. She had a surprisingly deep voice for such a tiny frame. The sergeant nodded. Will, will he be okay for, for the wall tomorrow morning? The healer shook her head. Lucky bastard. The sergeant muttered to himself and motioned for Nax to follow him outside. Much to Nax's relief, the scowl was gone. Nax didn't want to think about it. Dawn came way too quickly. Nax was a veteran, so he got his armor on quickly enough and got to the top of the wall around the city to defend it from whatever forces Fatefinder might bring to bear. The earth shook. In fact, it shook a full hour before they saw any of the troops. Tiny bits of stone from some of the houses with poor masonry crumbled loose. Horns and drums played in the distances as the banner with four different nations, each of Spielglass's enemies lined the field. What hurt was seeing the banners from the other Spielglass city-states. The thing was that they had been changed slightly. They still looked like the old banners, but with an added mark here or there to denote subservience to other nations. Nat couldn't tell much more than that. He wasn't a scald. There was a loud hiss and crack of thunder in the distance as large stones and exploding spheres of wood pummeled the wall, but it was, wasn't anywhere near as heavy as Nax thought it would be. They had kept their distance well out of range of Glasshouse's own catapults. Nax suspected that the Fatebinder had hired the Hushers to help him, but he'd been in enough campaigns to know that there was something weird about it all. They weren't trying to destroy the wall. Then he heard the sergeant whisper, They're looking for something. What? I don't know, but I hope they don't find it. Nax didn't know either, but he really didn't want to think about it. He just ducked his head behind the wall as another of the large missiles slammed into it. A short, later, a short while later, another missed the wall, and then a third. The sergeant looked at Nax. The sergeant's wrinkled face was hard to read, but he finally got a look of resolve and poked back from the wall. Where are we going, sergeant? I want to check something. A few officers looked like they were going to challenge them as they moved off the wall, but the sergeant gave them such a look that they backed off. At first, the sound of the impacts grew dim, but then it increased again. Without getting back up on the wall, the sergeant waited a few moments and then looked at Nax. They, then they proceeded to go right back down to the same place in the wall where they started from. It took less time now, and the sound of the strange siege engine continued hurling projectiles. It was enough to kill a man, but the wall stood firm. Then, still, the healers and the helpers had their hands full, carrying the wounded behind them. Nax shrugged. He didn't want to think about it, but the hard stare of the sergeant, sergeant drilled into him. The sergeant got around and looked him right in the face. The sound of the missiles increased, hammering and raining shards of wood and light all around the men. The sergeant ignored it, standing firm, not even blinking. Nax squirmed. I don't know, sir. Honest, I don't. Well, we're going to find out, aren't we? The sergeant picked him up by the scruff of the neck and dragged him to the campaign tent. The Lord Thrain was inside and was not a happy man. He looked with annoyance at the two guards just outside the tent. They dutifully stared forward and pretended not to notice the Thrain's 
withering glare for allowing someone to enter unchallenged. Nax approved. The Thrain looked at his own scald, a man much older than the scald in the bar, and back at the sergeant. He sat down on his small wooden battle throne awaiting an explanation. The sergeant said, I don't know, sir. That's why I'm here. They keep targeting him. Targeting him? The sergeant growl echoed. Yes, sir. The siege engines always follow him. The Lord Thrain looked very tired. Are you... And you thought bringing him to my tent was a good idea? The sergeant suddenly looked very chagrined and said, I didn't know what else to do, sire. No, I imagine you didn't. Nax didn't know what to do in this situation, so he kept his mouth shut like his mother had taught him to. It was amazing how useful a survival skill at keeping your mouth shut could be. The royal, scarred look, the royal scald looked Nax up and down. He slowly stood up from his chair and moved around Nax, trying to examine him from every angle. Nax tried to ignore him, but proved highly unsuccessful as bony fingers poked and prodded him. Nax finally slapped the old man's hands away when he pinched Nax's cheeks. Then he said, All right, enough of that. The old man looked startled and said, Have you seen any signs and portents lately? Nax looked up. Nax wanted to feign ignorance, but that would be hard. Almost nobody knew anything about the lower secrets, like magic or husher stuff, but prophecy was something that they taught you about as soon as you could speak, so that wasn't going to fly. It would be like pretending not to know the difference between a wide head arrow or a narrow, or narrow tip. Well, maybe. This was much more reasonable defense, because everyone thought they saw signs at one point or another in their life. That was one of the reasons people listened to skulls, who were more literate on that kind of thing. It kept you from it going around from pub to pub, giving people haunting looks and saying, You must give me your beer, according to prophecy. So Nax just said, I saw some weird cats and some trees acting kind of weird, but I didn't pay much attention. The royal scald nodded. And how many weird cats and trees did you see? Three. As the royal skull took in a deep breath, yes, I think you are bound to prophecy, which explains the fate Brinder's interest in you. Nax raised his eyebrows. Me? That didn't sound like a good thing. Were there any other signs of portents, anything unusual at all? Nax sighed. He hated thinking about this kind of thing. Well, there were those three clouds. Yes. Nax shrugged. There were clouds. There were three of them. And what makes you think it was a sign? Well, they looked a lot like giants. The royal scout nodded shazily. What were they doing and fighting? The royal scout had a look of triumph on his face. He turned to the high thrain and was about to speak when a dragon leg, thick as a barrel, attempt, attached to a foot as large as the high thrain's battle throne, came crashing through the tent. This had the unfortunate effect of crushing the royal skull to a bloody pulp. The p tent poles collapsed, sending the tent and everyone in it scattering to the four winds. Nax didn't know what was going on, but he knew that he didn't want to be around here. He didn't want to be around here. He fled north. The dragon's talon reached out and grabbed him, pulling him back towards the fate binder who rode on the dragon's back. N Nax took out his halberd and slashed the talon in vain, the sharpened blade bouncing off the scaly skin. He felt himself rise into the air, staring at the fate binder eye to eye. Uh, hello, he screamed to get out of the dragon's talons. You have to die. Uh, Nax tried chopping the dragon's claw a few times, but did no good. Uh, I'd rather not. You have to die. Nax just waited for the end, but then decided to give the dragon one more whack with the halberd. It didn't do anything. You have to die to prove that the prophecy can be beaten. Nax didn't really want to think about this, but he did think about it. He had, his whole life flashed before his eyes. He found himself thinking about having a family, about how likely it was now that he, that, that was, you know, that he was about to die. He'd never have a son or a daughter to carry on the line. That's it. That was just going to be him. What had he done with his life? Nothing. He was so caught up in his final thoughts about what a waste of his life that he didn't notice the bright white light that surrounded him, causing the dragon to drop him in pain. What is this? The fate binder shrieked and threw daggers at him, which were eaten by the flame. Nax dodged most of the daggers, but could feel the flame eating at the metal of the daggers as if they were mere snow. He tossed the rock back at the fate binder, which bounced off the arcane weavings in his cloak and armor. The fate binder unloosed a bolt of lightning from his fingertips. Nax could smell the ozone and felt fire rush up and down his nerves and limbs. He couldn't move. He couldn't hurt the pain may hurt so much 
and then the fire had eaten the daggers, moved back up along the lightning bolt that engulfed the flame, the fight binder in Azure Flame. Nax didn't really know about fire. He tried concentrating and making it burn hotter, which it didn't, so he picked up another rock and threw it at the fate binder. The fate binder tried dousing himself with water and failed. His flesh was being eaten by the unnatural fire, though his attempts to repair it were at least stalling his inevitable destruction. You have to die! The fate bender unleashed a last ditch talisman etched with runes and metal husher bands to enhance its explosive nature. The flame ate it and turned it to ash before it had gone even halfway. Nax threw another rock. Nax barely had the presence of mind to look down at himself and see the light, trying to ignore the feelings of futility and depression that battered against the walls of his mind. The light moved around him and through him, gathering brighter and brighter. Finally, a giant shaft of light came down from the sun and surrounded him like a searchlight of a lighthouse. The faint binder knelt down with one knee shielding his eyes with the, from the impossibly bright light, but instead the light burned him and the dragon to a cinder. Nax slowly got up, unsure of what he was going on, and then moved over to kick the ashes out of spite. More bright lights fell down from around the city, slamming into the army's surrounding spiel glass, burning it to a crisp. Was he the cause of that? Was he responsible for killing thousands of people? Nax didn't want to think about it, and with that, the light faded. He eventually found the sergeant's leg, so the sergeant himself had remarkably survived. The same could not be said about the high thrain, his scald, or poor plur plort. Without the fate binder to bind them, the remaining armies all disbanded, since apparently most of their supplies had been at the front. The fate binder had not anticipated a counterattack. Nax looked at the sergeant in his bed, waiting for him to wake up. You okay, sergeant? What happened? I burned everyone, or something around me did. Huh. Something around you did. Nax smiled at that and kept waiting at waiting by the sergeant. He wasn't sentimental or anything, but he wanted to make sure that the old guy came out of this okay. Nax wanted to find out if saving the city was worth anything monetarily speaking. According to the royal sage, Nax was destined to be the ancestor of someone very important. It was, particularly impo it was a particularly important prophecy that they refused to tell him much. Most people with secrets worth keeping in the world were like that. According to them, Nax himself was never going to do anything of great importance. That suited Nax just fine. The important thing was that he was able to take care, he was able to take off, he was able to take of the Sarge, setting him up for life, with a pleasant amount of left over. Of course, as he investigated his benefits a bit more, it became apparent that his descendants, and therefore his health, were a matter of national security. That meant the state had to help Nax produce as many heirs as possible. He'd live through it somehow. So I'm going to give that story um, a B. I initially was going to give it a B minus. Um, there's some things in the beginning that are just highly distractionary, in my opinion, that don't add to the value of the story. Um, for a little bit of background in this, in my opinion, um, I think that um, so I think. Um, Let's see here. There's a lot to unpack from this one. I, I'll start with what I was thinking when I wrote this, right? So the whole idea of this story, because a lot of stories come down to ideas like, you know, what would happen if a shark got genetically combined with a bear, right? Or a tornado in the case of Sharknado. Um, but, you know, in stories, a lot of times people focus on prophecy and fate and free will. And, you know, they try and f they try and mess with a prophecy without noting what they're messing with and this particular short story was for a novel that i just i started putting together between between the sixth and seventh novel i knew i wanted to write another one but i didn't know what i wanted to write and um actually let me look at the date on this story sorry real quick uh yeah okay maybe more like between the fifth and sixth novel in fact, I actually think it was before I wrote the sixth novel. But either either way, there, you know, as I after the fifth novel or Forever West, I took a while to kind of you know think of what I'm going to do next. And there were some starts and stops. And there was one novel that I started. I even got like twenty twenty five thousand words into, and it, it just and wrote like three or four of the short stories that you'll see in this short this series. You know, a lot of notes on the setting, and it. I got to a point in the novel where I just realized this isn't working, right? I don't think this is what people are going to be interested in. I, I just, it doesn't feel right. 
And I waited for National Novel Writing Month and wrote the sixth novel, and that everything about that series and that setting felt right, and I want to work more in it. And it's the same thing with the England May 7th book. I'm, right now, I have three major projects I'm going to work on, right? There's the... Inglemia series, and I'm nearly done with the first book of that series. There's the Forever West series, and I've written the first book, and I have a lot of notes and ideas on the second. We'll probably start writing that very soon. And then there's the third, which I'm calling Lasers Against the Dark Lord, which the sixth book is actually going to be part of an anthology of, of three, uh, basically three anthologies, which will probably have novellas in them as well as part of that series. The Spielglass Chronicles just don't do it for me. Um, and, you know, in some ways, even when writing a short story, little things work, like the races all have a name and a history behind them. But sometimes those details become too much and distracting. And I, I it's impossible for me to read this entirely as a reader without knowing that but i it just it, it seems to me that there are elements of this that were distracting about the setting it certainly started out slow i mean nax actually is a pretty decent character um you know he's basically just some guy that's a chain and a link that isn't the the fulcrum he isn't the hero he's the ancestor of a future hero and, you know, um, the gods in this setting basically went all Ark of the Covenant to play their game. And um, somebody thought that they thought they knew what prophecy was and they thought they knew the world worked and they literally bet their life on it and lost. Um, and I think it is hilarious to me all the times in our, in our own world how people who are faithful and think they understand their religions don't even give a second thought of what they're doing is actually God's will when God might have other ideas. Um, so, it, you know, the thing I like the most about this story, which is why I upgraded it from a B- minus to a B, is that to me it illustrates very well that faith in the wrong thing in a world where gods are real could literally kill you. This has been the Tossing Grenades at Windmills podcast. Buy my book, Have Name Will Travel, at Amazon and other markets. RedAnvilCreative.com contains all our podcasts. Copyright 2022! To fight the forces of evil!